Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast with me, Conor Whiteley, psychology student and international best-selling psychology author of over 30 psychology books, bringing you the latest psychology news, fascinating psychology topics and more each week. If you want to learn more, then please check out conorwhiteley.net forward slash books. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube video or follow on your favourite podcast app. And here's the show. Hi everyone, among the episode 252 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Colin Whiteley. And today's episode is on what is art therapy? And it is Saturday the 10th of February 2024 as I record this. So today's episode is actually quite a fun one because I really like looking at different forms of psychotherapy. Thankfully the numbers show that you wonderful audience members do it too. And I think art therapy is sort of a weird one because I've heard about it quite a lot. I've sort of, I sort of know of it. I know it's something to do with art, but because of its empirical like an and because the research isn't really sure about if it works or not. We don't thankfully hear about it like too much. But I know that some people love art therapy and I think that there are certain tricks or techniques that you might be able to pick up from art therapy that might help you with any client. And that's something that I sort of talk about in today's episode. So even though I have no intention of ever being trained up in art therapy because I mean like my art skills are quite horrific as they are and I have no intention of ever wanting to make a career out of art therapy but I still think that it's interesting to learn about it and learning is never a bad thing. So in today's episode we'll learn about what is art therapy, how does it work and what could clients expect from it so I really do recommend this great episode. So you've got that to look forward to in the content part of today's episode. So moving on to the psychology news section, we're reading from the British Psychological Society Research Digest. And the first one is, I have no idea if this is depressing or not at this point in time. I think towards November, it, this will be quite depressing. So, are you more likely to vote for a rule breaker? Leaders who break the rules sometimes find themselves on the receiving end of widespread public um, condemnation, as the UK's Partygate scandal clearly illustrated. However, despite the dangers it poses to their eventual grasp on their power, never mind their people, those who aspire to leadership are often advised to break the rules, write the authors of a new paper in the Journal of Experimental Psychology Applied. Astrid C. Homan at the University of Amsterdam and uh, her colleagues also point to the anecdotal evidence that rule breakers can be more successful than people who follow the rules. So uh, what should a would-be leader do? The answer, according to the new study, is not to break the rules but bend them. Those who do, they find, are perceived as more prestigious and dominant than their rule-breaking and rule-abiding counterparts. So this one, I think, is very good timing because, of course, 2024 is the major election year. Right, all over quite a lot of the world. I thought, for example, like the UK is going to have an election at some point <laughs> and the US will have it in November. So quite major and and then like I mean and Europe is also we're gonna have tons of um European Union elections in May in which I mean I stopped reading the European news because because the polls were just depressing, especially in France and Germany, the two most powerful countries. But anyway though, so this is not a political show. But I do think that this is quite an interesting idea that rule benders are actually better than rule breakers and rule abiders and this i can sort of see though because for example taking a the uk's party gate scandal and all which was flat out disgusting because um for our international audience the 
the UK government had tons of um, illegal parties during the height of COVID re- well, re- strict, which was a, against the law at the time that was they completely broke the rules and yes and i mean that was a massive scandal and everyone hated the government at the time but also um rule abiders and i can understand how they're better than rule breakers but again the rules can constrict people and to the rules and sometimes the rules just don't work for example so I think the idea of uh, people without bend of the rules but don't break them is definitely quite a useful idea because you're technically not doing anything wrong because you aren't breaking the rules but you're not letting the rules kind of throw you. So I can understand how that can be more appealing but I definitely don't think that it's a clean cut because there will obviously be other factors that influence someone's likeliness to vote for that particular candidate. So interesting and useful, especially in an election year. So the next one is, I intend to attend, boosting students' lecture attendance. To attend or not to attend is at the age of a question of many university students. The research has shown turning up to lectures boost academic achievement and provides a host of social benefits many still opt not to do so. The problem, writes Mark A. Elliott, Alan and David, in their guest piece for the Research Digest, is often not one of of a lack of inattention on the part of, of students, but rather an inability to translate good intentions into actions. Interventions are therefore required to enhance engagement, which in turn supports student performance and well-being. With that in mind, the University of Stratlin's Social Cognition Group introduced their new research, recently published published in the British Journal of Educational Psychology, presenting a tool which might just make a difference. And then if you want to look at this at all specifically, then head on over to the BPS Research Digest website. Now, but the reason why I'm not going to is because I can definitely testify to this, but that is that there's definitely a lot of factors about why students don't choose to attend, because sometimes it's the students themselves, like, for example, in my undergrad, I knew some really poorly in a gay students that did not want to be at university, they did not care about psychology, so their attendance was quite horrific. But also, I also know um, an old friend of mine, he actually didn't like um, going uh, to his lectures because he could do just as well, if not better, actually uh, focusing on the lecture material, not in uh, the lecture theatre. So that was like one other thing. And this week, I actually skipped a lecture because it was a revision lecture. And the past two, um, they were meant to be two hours long, so I drove down for 40 minutes there. 35 minutes back and I thought I was going for a two-hour lecture because they were revision lectures they were only 45 minutes so I was driving more than I was actually learning so this week I decided right I'll look at the um, revision slides and I'll make a decision because if there were too few revision slides then there's just no point in me going going but um, the lecture slides weren't uploaded until the last minute so by the time I saw the lecture slides and I saw, oh, it'd probably be a good idea to go down, it, I just didn't have enough time though, but I watched it online. So again, so there are different reasons why people skip the lectures, but lack of engagement, I definitely think it's an important problem. I think sometimes, yes, it might be to do with a specific lecture, like I had with stats, yeah, no one was engaged in that last term stats. But now, because we've got a, a, a good like lecturer, everyone is a lot more engaged. And I'm so badly tempted just to have her on the podcast because she's so good. But interventions, we definitely need them because we definitely need to help uh, help students turn their in attention into in engagement and action. Just they actually, just they actually do turn up to their lectures because. 
even if students aren't interested in in the topic they should definitely get a for the social benefits it's like i really like seeing different um friends and acquaintances in my lectures um just some food for thought lonely but not always alone so this is the last one by the way Though what they've often conflated, being alone doesn't necessarily mean feeling lonely. Sometimes time spent alone can feel nourishing and enjoyable, whereas at others, being around people can make us feel lonely and disconnected. The cliché of feeling alone in a crowd is a cliché for a reason, and it illustrates the complex interplay between socialising and feeling alone. Writing in the Journal of Research in Personality, Alexander Devins and their colleagues from the Universities of Arizona, Wisconsin and Indiana described their recent investigation into what actually leads us to feel lonely. Their findings are revealed that, as you might expect, those who spend very little of the time with others reported high feelings of loneliness, but more unexpectedly, so did those who spent a lot of time with others. In fact, even those who spent more than 75% of their time with others reported high levels of loneliness. Okay then, now that is interesting. Interesting on two main fronts. Firstly, I could not imagine spending that much time with other people. Like, I love people, I'm really social, but... I like getting on with my own stuff, and I'm sh and I know, and I know like half of that it, it's just autism. But still, I mean, I spending seventy five percent of my time of my week with other people. Now, I mean, like that's super social. <laughs> I probably spend about a third of my time no, about a third or fifty percent of my week with other people. That's super social for me, and I think that's quite like extreme at times. <laughs> But getting on to a more serious point. So these findings definitely show and definitely highlight that but that loneliness isn't as simple as a real waste fault. And I think in the past few years, I think we're starting to realise this. But I would also be interested to see is there a difference in the effects? For example, if you're I'm gonna call this traditionally lonely lonely like you don't spend time with other people so you feel lonely does that affect your mental health or your physical health or to be honest both differently than people who feel lonely but spend a lot of time with other people and i think the causes will also be quite different so i'm definitely looking forward to researching this more in fact i have seen a few um psychology papers on this i might do podcast episodes on it in the future i think this is quite interesting and this is what i like about the psychology news section and this is what i do this a podcast because it keeps me learning and to be honest it's findings like this it's findings that to be honest are so counterintuitive and to be honest this is a weird finding this is actually a really, really weird finding because you would not expect people who spend tons of time with other people to be lonely. And it's these weird findings that make me passionate, make me enjoy psychology. And this is why I keep continuing this uh, this uh, podcast even after 252 episodes. So that is definitely some interesting uh, thoughts thoughts though and i'll definitely be looking into that more in the future so i hope you enjoy the psychology news section so let's move on to the personal update so we're moving on to the personal update so this week's been really busy and there were quite a few different points that i actually want to make at you at because i think that these points are going to be useful in engaging and hopefully they're going to help you so the first one is definitely psychology related because this week I really started to understand our studio more because I finally got back to my um, computing vision and for my egg exam which, which is a week after this podcast episode comes out. 
So that I think is quite an interesting one because the reason why I'm starting to understand ARM or is that it really is just all about your codes. And if you got and if you know the codes and if you have a list of different codes which you can use for different functions, then it is a lot easier. And as long as you remember how to report the findings, the starters, then that the, then that really does help you. Of course. Our studio is still really annoying, I think, is that even if you miss one letter, even if you capitalise it wrong, even if you put a, a space in the wrong place, it doesn't work. That I think is beyond annoying, and I sort of hate it, <laughs> in that sense. Also though, you've got to remember to turn on your packages, because I was putting in all the right code, but it wasn't working. And then I remembered, oh yeah, then, oh yeah, like there's this one package that I didn't turn on. And I'm thinking, it's already installed on my on my R Studio. Why can't it just detect it for itself? Again, I'm not a computer programmer and I just think that's annoying. But when you remember to do that, and also when you remember to create the right um, file directory or whatever, so it reads your data correctly into RStudio. Yes, as long as you do all of those things, <laughs> RStudio is very learnable. Like last time, I hated R, and I really am saying this for the psychology students, or to be honest, even psychology professionals that are starting to lose hope with R, because you can learn it, it requires dedication, you need good resources, that definitely helps when you actually have the correct uh, resources from the university. But it is learnable and uh, if you just hang in there, then you will understand it, I promise you. You just gotta keep at it, try and find some good resources. So I probably will not do any R Studio content in the future because I just, because I do not get passionate about R. <laughs> Also, but something else that is sort of psychology related, but I was in my statistics lecture on no Wednesday, and what happened was that I went out for my lunch break, and I saw that I had a, a missed call and a text from my doctors. Now, I've been sitting on an autism referral letter for quite a few months. So on the 24th of January, I sent it to my doctors, and I did not expect them to do anything with it. But they phoned me and they texted me to make an appointment. Why they want an, uh, an appointment about my referral letter, I do not understand because everything is in this referral letter. I just want my doctor to put me in the NHS waiting queue so in five or six years' time I can get a diagnosis. <laughs> And yes, it is like that long. So thankfully, I do have that doctor's appointment this week. And hopefully my referral will, will get to moved on. So I can eventually become a diagnosis with autism officially. Because I would really like that. Of course, I would have liked it about a decade ago. But there was tons of... I'm not going to get into that because that's some... Um, yeah. Because that's a very messy issue with um, family, society, my local area, etc. And the last thing I actually want to talk about is definitely more UK centric when it comes to universities. But I think that um, um, international audience, I can actually make quite a good use of it too though. So me and my friend, I've been actually joined the university's Tinker Society or the Maker Society this week, which I which I admit has nothing to do with psychology, but bear, bear, bear with me, there is a point here. And it was really good to learn about 3D printing. We started to try and make a like 3D printed like a Lego cube, cube though, which I think is definitely a lot harder than it sounds. <laughs> and like me and my friend realized that I'm horrific at drawing. Well, when my friend was like drawing out this like Lego brick really um, professionally with all the measurements and it was really clear to understand what they were measuring. Mine was, yeah, mine was just 
awful. Mine was actually quite horrific. My drawing, like I understood it perfectly, but my friend did not whatsoever. So that was like quite fun though. And my point is, is that we both had like a good time. We both like had fun, and we both pushed ourselves. So my point is. UK university students is that if you have an interest if you think something might sound fun but it, but you're brand new to this then take a chance go to this society go with your friends and just have fun because you never know about what you're actually going to learn I thought for example like um, I had an interest in bouldering and so did my friend we do not climb <laughs> Believe me, I do not climb to save my life. I don't even do much exercise except my 10,000 steps a day and some other stuff. But we are both like went to it, we're having fun and Monday night was like the most fun I've had like for ages. And then Wednesday night, well Wednesday night at the like Tinker Society, I have never done food printing. I've never tried to make, uh, I've never tried to make a something. But I learned a lot and it was really interesting. And now, because of my fiction books and some of my other interests, I've actually got tons of uh, tons of different ideas which are going to benefit me in the future. And it gives a chance for me and my friend to like, hang out. So just uh, go for it. Have fun and just see where your interest like, takes you. Don't just go to university for your degree. University is so much more than it. Okay, so I just wanted to like leave that as a little parting message. And as always, I always love to hear your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can always email me, connorwiley.net. You can always leave a comment out of the show notes at connorwiley.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi Wiley or leave a comment on the Facebook post at Connor Wiley Psychology Author. And today's episode has been sponsored by Abnormal Psychology, the causes and treatments for depression, anxiety and more. So the reason why this is a sponsor for today's episode is because this great, really easy to understand book helps you to understand what to be biological, social and, and the psychological causes for depression and a whole host of different mental health conditions. But then the book also as well as the, the treatment side. For example, how do psychotherapies work and, and what's the theory behind them? So it gives you a really nice introduction to that. And this connects to today's episode. Well, because our therapy is a possible treatment for depression and a whole host of other mental health conditions. So if you want to understand more about the oppression and, uh, and anxiety and how our therapy might be able to uh, treat them in addition to a wide range of other psychotherapies, then this uh, book is a, a great one-stop shop for you for a really good in that deduction. So I really do recommend it. So that's Abnormal Psychology, The Causes and Treatments of Depression, Anxiety and More. Available at all your major ebook retailers, and you can get the paperback and the hardback version from Amazon, your local books, or local library if you request it. Or you can get the audiobook, narrated by artificial intelligence, from a selected audiobook retailers like Google Play, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, and selected library systems like Overdrive, Baker and Taylor, Bibliotheca, and more. So whilst buying books helps to support the creation and the editing of the podcast, my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. And as always, massive thank you to my wonderful patrons because your support shows that you like the show and that you want it to continue. So if you wanted to become a patron of the show and get tons of great rewards, now you can. At patrons.com forward slash the Psychology World Podcast. So that's enough for the personal update. Let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So we're moving on to the content part of today's episode. So we're going to be talking about what is art therapy. This is a great episode. I really enjoyed it and I definitely think that there's a lot that all of us can learn. So let's dive into it. 
Art therapy is a type of psychotherapy that uses creative techniques to help people express themselves and examine the emotional and psychological undertones of the art. Some of the artistic techniques include painting, colouring, sculpturing and collaging. Then the trained art therapist helps the client to interpret the metaphor, symbols and non-verbal messages in their artwork. As well as this helps the client to get a better understanding of their feelings and behaviour so that they can move on to resolving deeper mental health difficulties and their causes. Personally, I don't only have to admit that I'm a little sceptical of this already, because this sounds very subjective, and I think that this might be great for some people. For example, people who struggle verbally, or really, really like art. Yet yeah, for other people, this won't be fun, or very good for them, in terms of using art as a medium for communication to the subconscious. For example, I like art to some extent, but not enough to want to use it as a therapy medium. In that case, I personally prefer talking therapies, which this does in love to some extent, but not as much as more traditional, I'm going to say in air quotes, psychotherapies. And my opinion is supported by the literature, because research into art therapy is a mixed at best, since some studies have found that art therapy can be effective for different people, but other studies have found little benefit to the mental health of clients. And um, all the references and all the citations for today's podcast episode can be found over at connorwhitely.net forward slash podcast. So this is not the most empirically supported type of therapy, to say the least. When is art therapy used? Interestingly, art therapy can be applied to, to a very wide range of, of settings and it can be useful for a wide range of mental health conditions, such as art therapy is a useful for therapists working with couples, groups and individuals, as well as it doesn't matter if this happens in a wellness centre, private counselling, hospitals, senior centres or other community settings. Art therapy can be useful in all of these settings, which is a brilliant and it helps to, to make this a therapy an accessible option for lots of people. In addition, because I am terrible at art and I have absolutely no desire to actually get better at it, it's good to know that a client doesn't need any artistic talent for the therapy to be successful, since art therapy isn't about the end result of the artwork. It's about finding the associations between the client's inner life and the creative choices they make during the creation process. That's why art therapy can effectively be a springboard for your clients to remember older memories, tell stories that could reveal more about their past and even their beliefs in their unconscious minds. Moreover, when it comes to the list of uh, mental health conditions art therapy is a is so useful for, you'll see that it covers all the main types. For example, depression, anxiety, stress, trauma and a grief. Yet it also covers emotional exploration, self-esteem problems, personality disorders, as well as physical disabilities and illnesses a client might have. What to expect in art therapy? I know you are all many psychology students and psychology professionals, so you might find it strange that I'm including a, a section on what to expect in art therapy from a client's perspective. Yes, I'm doing this because if we want to understand what our clients are go through, then this can help us with empathy towards our clients as well as there is a chance that you might be listening to this episode today and remember in the future if you're working with a client and your current therapy isn't really working and, and you will believe that they might benefit from art therapy in a set. It's a possibility and learning never hurts. Therefore, the first session of art therapy will be very similar to basically every other form of psychotherapy. A client will be meeting with the therapist and talking about why you will want psychological help and they will learn what this therapist has to offer them. 
then the client and the art therapist will work together to create a treatment plan that involves creating some artwork. Afterwards, the client will start creating and during this process, there will be times when the therapist observes how well you work without judgement or interference. Next, the, when the client has finished their artwork, or at times when the client is still working on it, the therapist will ask her questions about how they feel about the artistic process, what was easy or difficult about the artwork, and any thoughts or memories that the client has about the artwork during the creation process. Also, it is very common for therapists to ask their clients about their egg experiences and feelings before they provide any observations. Finally, using this information, the art therapist will use a wide range of creative and innovative interventions that are tailored to each a client to help them. For example, an art therapist might guide a client to build clay structures of family members in engaging a free association about different pieces of artwork or just tell a story through a photo collage. I suppose that the nice thing about art therapy is that it gives the therapist a lot of our freedom to help their client. Cognitive behavioural therapy and the vast majority of, of the therapies that I've come across are a lot more manualised than art therapy and most of the time that is, a, that is a brilliant but it does restrict therapists in what they can do with their clients to some extent at least. At least that because of course in the real world no therapist just a six to one therapeutic like model. How does art therapy work? So to wrap up this clinical psychology episode Let's look at how art therapy works to improve people's mental health. Therefore, art therapy is based on the idea that therapeutic value can be found in artistic self-expression for people who want to heal or understand themselves or their behaviours at a deeper level. In addition, according to the American Art Therapy Association, art therapists are trained to understand the roles the various art media, texture and colour can I play in the therapy process as well as how these tools that can help clients with all their feelings, thoughts and psychological dispositions. As a result, art therapy combines psychological therapy and some kinds of visual art medium into a specific standalone therapy but it is used at times in other psychotherapies too. In other words, art therapy is another example of a therapy module that can be picked up and combined with other modules depending on what the therapist needs. Similar to how therapists combine systemic and cognitive behavioural approaches depending on what's best for their clients. Therefore, research shows that there are five benefits to art therapy and these further help to explain how art therapy works. Firstly, it helps to improve a a client's insight and comprehension as it allows them to verbalise their experiences and emotions. Secondly, art therapy improves emotion and impulse regulation because it improves a client's ability to regulate and control their emotions. Thirdly, art therapy is a useful behaviour change because clients learn to change their behavioural responses towards others and themselves. This could be a result of of the self-directed nature of the creative process. Penultimately, art therapy benefits a a client's personal integration because art helps us to improve their self-image and their identity. Finally, art helps to improve a a client's perception as well as self-perception because it helps people to focus on the present moment and identify and connect up with their emotions and their body awareness. And uh, personally, I know that I've mentioned this a few times before on the the podcast, but when you really start to think about psychotherapies as a whole, 
you really do start to see the commonalities between them. For example, our therapy helps a behavior change. Well, isn't that a form of a behavior change? Basically, behavioral activation, which comes from the behavioral approach. Also, art therapy helps a client to focus on the present moment. Could that have come from the mindfulness-based approaches, which is sort of back connected to CBT? As well as art therapy helping emotion and impulse regulation. Well, isn't that basically the premise of most psychotherapies? Well, I know that art therapy is a unique in itself, but there are lots of commonalities between all types of therapy. And just to reinforce my point, I don't say this to discredit any psychotherapy, because if it is evidence-based, but that's a big one when it comes to art therapy, <laughs> not. And if it works to improve the people's lives, and I have no issue at all with it. Well, I just think that it's funny to think about how interconnected all of these different forms are. Conclusion. So whilst I will never ever want to be trained in art therapy, was I'm not so because I'm just not sold on its effectiveness and art has no interest for me. I think it is interesting. As well as the entire point of these therapy based podcast episodes is to help us learn about other forms and other concepts from different therapies. Therefore, if you ever hear of a concept or idea from a new, at least new right to you, um, a form of, uh, of uh, therapy, then uh, you can research, get trained in it, and maybe use it in uh, your own current or future clinical work. It is all about expanding our psychological knowledge. So, as a reminder, our therapy uses our creative techniques to help people express themselves and examine the emotional and psychological undertones of their art. Then let the client interpret the metaphor, symbols and non-verbal messages in their artwork to better understand their feelings and behaviour so that they can move on to resolving deeper mental health difficulties and their causes. And our therapy gives us uh, more tools and ideas uh, to use in our current or future clinical work. And that's uh, great. Art therapy is interesting, a little quirky, and I think that it could be useful in uh, the right situation. And as long as it improves lives, decreases psychological stress and uh, helps people, then art therapy is hardly a bad idea. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and you got something out of it. I know that I definitely did because art therapy. For me, before I did this uh, podcast episode, it was sort of surrounded by mystery. Me and some friends had sort of spoken about this, but none of us were 100% sure what art therapy was because it just doesn't have the empirical backing that modern clinical psychology requires. So it's not really spoken about too much at the university and in a certain text of books. So I like it. I've never wanted to be trained in it and I would never want to use it. But I think it's definitely interesting. And if this does sound cool to right you, then check it out. Maybe I think about going in to it. And if you know someone who enjoyed today's episode, then please share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help us with words about the podcast. And if you want to learn more, definitely check out A Normal Psychology, the causes and treatments of depression, anxiety and more. Available in all the usual places and you can get the AI narrated audiobook at a selected audiobook retailers and library systems if you request it. And if you want to become a patron of the show, then please head on over to patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast. So have a great day everyone and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. Please remember to like the video and subscribe to the, the YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your favourite podcast app. 
And if you wanted to learn more, then please check out the backlist of the podcast episodes or my books at conwiley.net. So have a great day and I'll see you next time.